happy today. Very happy today to have four distinguished guests to introduce. Um, one of whom is speaking to us, but uh, three others who uh, uh, are, are, we're, we're very happy to have here as well. Um, there in the back, we have uh, Karen Nober, who's the executive director of the Massachusetts State Ethics Commission. Uh, uh, her colleague, David Giannotti, uh, who's the director of training and education at the State Ethics Commission. Uh, and right over there is Carla Miller, who's a fellow at the Ethics Center, uh, former federal prosecutor who's worked a lot with uh, state ethics uh, issues in Florida. And um, they're, what, amongst the many things they're responsible for is basically every two years educating some 400,000 Massachusetts state, local, municipal employees about what they need to know uh, to keep out of ethical trouble. And we're, we're on a, in a long-term discussion with them about how we can both uh, refine and improve uh, some of that outreach uh, and also tailor it to the kind of needs that city governments have. Uh, so we're delighted to have them visiting today. Uh, they're coming from a, an earlier session this morning uh, of ethics training. Um, last and certainly not least, though, we have Max Bazerman, who comes to us from the business school. Uh, and Max has been involved with the Ethics Center for a number of years and one of the pioneers of connecting psychology research to a lot of very practical issues uh, in business and institutional design. Um, before I let Max get started, though, I, I wanted to introduce him to you all uh, and warn him, warn him of the type of students he's going to be speaking to because uh, he may, you may have this impression, and, and certainly if people are coming from outside the university, you might think the Harvard students are very cold, calculating, rational, objective, dispassionate, uh, uh, reasoned you know, decision makers. Um, but I have to report to you the, the results of a survey that we ran last night uh, and some of its troubling results. And you can maybe help us make sense of these things. So uh, I'm delighted. We had about 93 people answer the survey. It went out very late. Thank you so much uh, for participating in this. And um, uh, unbeknownst to you, I'd randomized a few questions. So everyone saw the same. I think it was nine questions. But there might have been a few things changed in what, how it actually, a word here or there, appeared to you. So let me, uh, let me just walk through a few of these. So I began with this question. Um, it's not actually true, but Harvard, I guess they are discussing perhaps uh, admitting various sorts of non-traditional students. And I gave you a little statistic about these sorts of students and said that 20% of them will probably fail out uh, and not complete their degree. Do you think it's a good idea to admit these sort of students? Um, which I think it's, you know, it's an open question. You could argue it either way. Uh, half of you saw a slightly different question where it, instead of saying 20% would fail out, you said you saw that 80% would succeed and complete their degree. And are there any math majors in the room? Uh, because the, in most tellings of this, 20% failure is another way of saying 80% success. Um, and the interesting question is whether this should actually change the judgments you had of this sort of thing. So uh, it turns out when the group, about 50 of you who saw the 20% failure statistic, 41% um, thought that you should consider admitting these sorts of students. So a minority um, out there. Anyone want to guess what it was? It's about 60% um, that thought that these students should be admitted, uh, simply considering that statistic from the other direction, the other perspective. Um, if you were taking a vote, this went from a minority position to a majority position. Uh, if we were actually on the admissions councils deciding this, uh, so there's a lot packed into the way we process statistical information, mathematical information, and that might be something to consider uh, when we think about institutions and how we want to filter information. We had another question asked whether you trust a banker or bankers. That was the small little distinction, a singular or plural. Should this affect your judgment of the banking industry? Uh, maybe. I mean, maybe there's a different valence to those two things. Um, interestingly, and I find this uh, in some research I've done across the board, if you consider groups in the plural, they're almost universally distrusted more. Um, so thinking about a singular person uh, in a profession, there seems to be more willingness to trust them, whereas there's something about the plurality, having many people. Yeah. Whereas bankers would conjure up more of the Wolf of Wall Street archetype. 
And some of you might know there's, there's a long-standing mystery in uh, American politics that even when 98% of or 95% of people say they distrust Congress, the vast majority trust their congressman or congresswoman. Um, so the, there, there could be a lot of good reasons for that, but something worth maybe keeping in account as well. Um, this was a, a little question that's going to it's going to mirror some questions we uh, are going to look at in a few weeks when we consider the pharmaceutical industry and its interactions with doctors. I think this is a um, not unusual scenario that you might uh, encounter down the line where you discover a doctor has some financial interest in a drug and that might change your prescribing behavior and you as a patient need to decide whether to maybe opt for a different sort of drug, a generic, or take with their more expensive um, uh, recommendations. So on this, I, I gave this up, put this up there. As you notice, there's a pronoun. Uh, this, in this one, it's he. Uh, whether he thinks a brand name drug is better. Uh, the other one, it was she. Do you think there'd be a difference in people's willingness to trust? Which one would be more trusted? Which one? So who, who thinks uh, people are more willing to take the man's advice? Okay. <laughs> How many of you think it's more, you're more likely to take the woman's advice? You are not very good judges of your own uh, sort of biases here. Because it's, so and these are, uh, I double check this just to make sure because it went against my intuition as well. Um, you're more likely to reject the advice of the female, it's slightly more likely to reject the advice of the female doctor uh, when you saw that pronoun in there rather than when you saw the, the male doctor in there. Um, this is very small, and it's maybe not significant, uh, something to consider. This, this was really interesting to me. Uh, there's a debate right now in Arizona about a law, uh, about um, basically what services do you legally need to provide to basically anyone who walks in the door versus can you discriminate. This is a, a bakery out there, had to, it was a one of many bakeries that's disputing whether they need to bake a cake for a gay marriage. Um, I think this is the same question, just phrased in a slightly different way. Should the law prohibit or should the law allow? And when it's framed as not allowing, uh, you had almost 80% of people thinking this should be illegal, um, but when it's framed as prohibiting, that dropped 20 percent. This is a pretty big drop. Um, and again, I, uh, I, I ask, you know, we debate all the time whether a law is right or wrong, and uh, we often think that we can get to the substance of that debate pretty easily. People should understand what's at stake when they're saying yes or no. It shouldn't depend on a word or two, but this is a pretty big effect. Uh, this is a this actually, are, these are two different questions, um, but I can note that we get slightly different answers in the things reported. I think they are actually different questions. Um, finally, we, you know, Larry and I were very interested in trying to evaluate the course halfway through, uh, what we're doing, good or bad. And uh, so half of you, we, we asked to just tell us how you think the class is going on a 100-point scale. So one scale began at zero, went up to 100. The other one was anchored at zero, but you could go 50 on either side. Uh, which scale do you think was higher? Okay, everyone who thinks the first one was higher, raise your hand. Everyone who thinks the second one was higher. Aha, uh -huh, pretty divided. So it turns out they're basically indistinguishable. <laughs> uh, you all are really pretty good with these sorts of numbers. Uh, it is pretty much right on, you know, right on track. Um, Going pretty well. We're gonna, we're gonna have a discussion about sections soon, but the, uh, uh, but we're we're very happy with the results, and it's such a reliable. Uh, we, we're getting very reliable feedback, so we're uh, that you know this is one way in which actually this instrument didn't matter very much. You're you're all pretty good about uh, registering this uh, independently of these two um, uh, mediators. So that's all to say that uh, that the, the class is very human. They're not the the robotic actors that you might have assumed for Harvard undergraduates. Be, being a psychologist, you probably understand some of that. Is there any clever way of finding out this, which of them gives you bad ratings? Uh, I can't divulge that. But uh, no, actually, uh, there, there, <laughs> there was uh, one, uh, right when I went in there, I found out there was one guy who had rated us at like negative 40. 
Um, and then I realized it was the very first one. It was part of my testing when I was initially programming it up. So I figured out who that, that person was. Um, Ooh, question, yeah. yeah. What was the headaches question about? Oh, um, it was simply the, uh, sorry, I'll go, go back there very quickly. Um, one said, do you get headaches frequently? And if so, how often? The other one said, do you get headaches occasionally? Uh, and how often? And that little prime. Um, and again, I, they are slightly different questions. Because, so you might just answer no to that one. Um, but we're, we're getting, uh, we a lot more people answer the second one, but it was a lot much lower rate, uh, and that was for the higher. So that's, that's introducing you to the class, uh, Professor Bazerman, just so you know what you're dealing with. Whether or not these, uh, you know, how, how deep the, this should trouble us and its Im implications for how we think about it, how institutions function, I think is an open question. Um, but we're, we're delighted to have you with us and hopefully to, to think about this in a broader framework and um, not only understands various sorts of psychological biases, but what those implications are when we think more generally about society and its institutions. So, Thanks. great. Yes, here's your clicker. And I have a feeling I've, uh, yes, there you go. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, good to be with you. Um, could I have your microphone on, please? That's a good idea. Okay, how's that? The microphone on now? Thank you. We're good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the, today's talk is going to be about bounded ethicality. And, and one way to think about that is how to um, connect what Professor English was just talking about specifically to the ethical context. Um, the work that I'll be talking about has a whole host of different co-authors across um, the various things that I'll be talking about. Um, but I think it's fair to say nothing I'll be talking about. Um, I did on my own. So th all, all of these people are extraordinarily relevant um, to the talk. Um, now, about 11 years ago, um, I was in a room bigger than this. And Professor Banaji, who you met earlier this week, was giving a talk. Um, and she always gives amazing talks. Um, and, um, and in that talk, um, she showed this video. Now, this video was made in the 1970s, but I first saw it um, in in Professor Banaji's talk in 2003. And many of you have seen this or have seen a cousin of it. Um, uh, uh, for those, some of you know Gorilla, um, that, that, that might uh, connect to something that, that uh, you'll recall, but I'll, I'll get to the Gorilla in a minute. Um, but when I was in your situation watching a talk, um, Professor Banaji basically explained that there's two videos here, one with players in white t-shirts, a different video with players in dark t-shirts. And the task for the audience was to count the number of passes among the players in white t-shirts while ignoring the people in the dark t-shirts because they'll interfere with your ability to count the number of passes in the white t-shirts. Okay. And then she yeah. played it. Um, and this video lasts 18 seconds. So if you don't agree with me that this is the best video ever made, it, that, it won't really hurt you because it doesn't last that long. And some of you are trying to count the passes. Um, and some of you may have some hints or might be suspicious of something. Um, but the video lasts 18 seconds, okay. um, and the video Come ends with a pass in the air. And including that pass in the air, um, the correct answer was 11. So some of you can clap if you got it right. Um, um, and then Professor Banaji, after finding out that some of us got the 11 right and some of us got the 11 wrong, um, she said, did anyone notice anything unusual? And someone in the back of the room said, the woman with the umbrella. And I was sitting there thinking, what? And then a couple of other people in a room of about 300 people said, yeah, I saw the woman with the umbrella too. And then kind of grew to, to a, about maybe 2% of the audience was commenting about the woman with the umbrella. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll play the exact same video again. Okay. Don't bother to count this time, because it, it might interfere with some other interesting information, um, like the woman with the umbrella that's clearly walking by. Um, and when people are asked to count the number of passes, um, they tend to do what most of us do at Harvard University. We're pretty good okay. at focusing. How we focus on, on, the t on the task that we're given, and we miss clearly relevant information in our environment. Now, there's a <clears throat> this video was made in the 1970s by Ulrich Neisser, one of Neisser's students, um, uh, Dan Simons with um, Chris Chabriz, made a much more famous video with a, gorilla, a woman dressed in a gorilla outfit who walks by. Um, more people see the gorilla, but the majority of people don't see the woman with the umbrella or the gorilla. Now, some of you are thinking, but what's the point? You told me to count passes. That's what I was doing. I wasn't focusing on looking for other information. And the point is that in life, we often have a task in front of us, but
but there's important stuff to do that isn't part of the task that we're given. And um, just to report my own performance, I correctly counted the passes as 11, and I never saw the woman with the umbrella. And it's fair to say this has been my obsession for the last 11 years. Um, now, um, Ulrich Neisser called this phenomena inattentional blindness. Um, and um, uh, Mazarin, Dolly Chug, and I use the term bounded awareness to refer to the broader phenomena where it's not just perceptual information that we see with our eyes that we can miss, but there's all kinds of information that we can miss. And some of that information has an, has an ethical connotation to it. Um, and I see some of you taking notes, which you're welcome to do, but I, I'm also happy for these slides to become available to you. So um, what, do whatever you like. So, um, so one set of information is to, is to be bounded to the ways in which we act unethically without our own awareness. So this talk is not in any way making a statement denying the common existence of bad behavior by bad people doing bad things when they know that they're doing something wrong. But what I want to suggest is that it's important to think about situations in which all of you have engaged in bad behavior without any intention of doing anything wrong. And, and these behaviors are hardwired in a similar way to the problems that Bill English presented um, just a few minutes ago. That is, we have no intention of doing anything wrong, but we seem to do something wrong on a somewhat regular basis. In today's talk, what I want to do is give you a quick overview of what are some of the ways in which um, our ethics is bounded. Um, a less quick overview of the fact that not only do we engage in bad behavior without knowing that we're doing anything wrong, but we also often fail by, by our failure to notice the unethical behavior of those around us. And I want to suggest that there's often things that we can do to change ethical behavior. We can nudge, ethical, uh, we can nudge people to, toward more ethical behavior. And then I'm going to be applying it in some public policy context um, and then talk about why I think it's critically important to think about bounded ethicality as well as uh, standard corruption in terms of problems that um, that um, institutional corruption needs to deal with. Okay, so um, you, you, you met Professor Benaji earlier this week who talked about implicit attitudes and along the way I'm sure she also touched on in-group, out-group biases where we favor our in-group over the out-group. Um, and these are um, behaviors where we discriminate, um, not because we are making a conscious decision to favor people who are like us, but we do it in a natural way without knowing that we're even doing, doing so. Um, Dave Messick, my, my colleague at Northwestern a number of years ago, um, commented on um, the first of many Federal Reserve Board studies that show that African Americans are discriminated against in the mortgage market. And one of the things that he noted was that the media was getting it wrong. The media was focusing on the hostile white loan officer who didn't like African Americans. And what he argued was, that the much more likely phenomena was that the white loan officer was giving mortgages to marginally underqualified white applicants who were a whole lot, lot, lot like the loan officer. The problem is that when you give away a scarce resource to people who are like you, you're indirectly discriminating against people who are different than you. We tend to discount the future. When you don't save enough for retirement, that tends to be your problem or your child's problem. But when you discount the future and you run up the debt or you cut down the forest or you over harvest the ocean, it moves from being a bad decision to becoming an unethical decision because you're consuming in the short term and dumping um, the long term problems on the next generation. And that's what Professor Lessig and I are doing to all of you. Um, our, our generation is basically creating a variety of problems um, that, that you will inherit. Um, Overclaiming credit. If you've taken an introductory psychology class, um, you probably know from, from the Ross and Sicoli study, if you ask husband and wife in a heterosexual marriage, um, you, you ask each, each of them, what percent of the household work do you do that's done by husband or wife? So we're excluding paid help or children who are doing any of the work. You get the husband's percentage, the wife's percentage. The sum total, on average, comes up between 122 to 130 percent, depending on the study. Um, and there's lots of reasons why that would occur. Um, what we know is overclaiming credit is a common phenomena. And um, 
If you um, work on a group project with three of your friends in the room, when you're all done, if you each write down your honest estimate of what percent of the work you did, um, my best guess for a four-person group is it'll come up to about 140%. Okay? Um, and that's without you even having an audience that you're trying to fool. Rather, that reflects honest belief about the degree to which you did more than your fair share of the work. Um, and we also know that um, much like uh, Professor English manipulated the frame with the 2080 trick that you saw, um, uh, uh, what Kern and Chug show is that people are much, much more likely to cheat to avoid a loss than they are to obtain a gain. Um, and that they show that you can frame many problems as losses or gains, and people are, are just dramatically more likely to cheat in the loss domain than in the gain domain. And I think that that has some very important implications for thinking about when we need to be worried about unethical conduct, particularly as we come out of a very, very difficult economy. Okay, but what I want to spend um, the next chunk of time on is not sort of awareness of your own unethical behavior, but the fact that you're often not aware of the, uh, we, we fail to pay attention to the unethical behavior of others. Um, so we tend to have what, what, what Barron and Hershey call an outcome bias. That is, we tend to not get mad at people for unethical behavior until a bad outcome occurs. Okay? So the fact that they engaged in an unethical behavior, we don't seem to be concerned unless a bad outcome occurs as well. And at some level, this is institutionalized into legal context. So if we have two people who shoot at, a, uh, at somebody and they're both trying to kill that person, but one injures their target, the other one kills their target, the legal system does not treat those as the same offense. The outcome ends up mattering a great deal. But if you think about a managerial context where we want to reward wise behavior, um, we want to pay attention to the quality of the decision rather than the outcome occurred, but we tend to not do that. We hold people accountable for the bad outcomes that occur. Um, slippery slope. When, when people engage in unethical behavior that erodes slowly over time, we're less likely to notice their unethical behavior than when they fall off of, uh, off of a cliff. So I'm going to come back and talk about Arthur Anderson and Enron in a little bit. Um, but one question is, how did Arthur Anderson, which seemed to have an okay reputation before the Enron debacle, ever say okay to the books of Enron? And we kind of imagined that one day Enron became a bad firm and Arthur Anderson still said okay. But a different image is that in fact Enron eroded the quality of their financial statements slowly over time. And each year, what, what Arthur Anderson was doing was saying yes to something that was sli only slightly more egregious than what they said OK to last year. Motivated blindness, um, the kinds of things I'm thinking about. Okay? And in, in these stories, and you, you may have your favorite up here, um, I'm not implying that there weren't people who noticed and failed to act. But I think that in all of these cases, there are people who sort of noticed and sort of didn't collect more information and, and, and as a result didn't act. And that there was a moral failure um, on the part of these various actors from the child abuse scandals at Penn State and the Catholic Church to Jamie Dimon, uh, who seems to have been a pretty good guy most of his life, not noticing a shockingly large number of things in the last five or six years. Um, the Madoff story is it's, it's kind of an amazing story, but it's also kind of a boring story. You have a very smart guy who got away with stealing money from people um, in a moderately sophisticated manner. I think that the psychologically more interesting story is that how, how is it that there were so many people that had access to the data who simply didn't notice that his returns were impossible? And on a lot of these, you could be thinking about maybe they did know, but the 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 hedge fund manager um, with French nobility who basically learned that his money was gone and, and he had invested all of his extended family's money and his friend's money in the, in, in the fund, then shot himself. Okay? I think we have pretty good evidence um, that he didn't notice and there's also pretty good evidence that he had lots and lots um, of hints. Um, I put myself up there because um, I think that lots of academics study their own problems. Um, and I'll just briefly tell you, 
in 2005, um, I was spending a lot of hours working for the Department of Justice as an expert witness um, against the tobacco industry. So if you Google Max Tobacco, you could read about this if you like. Um, and, um, and I'm not going to tell you about the, the trial. Rather, I'm going to tell you about what happened after I had already spent 167 hours working for the Department of Justice. Um, I was working with a Department of Justice attorney, a young attorney who I knew pretty well. Um, he's a very polite person, and in the first few hours of working with me, he uh, kindly referred to me as Professor Bazerman, and I corrected him, and he had learned to call me Max. And, um, and I showed up in Washington to prepare for going to court on the, on the Wednesday following that weekend. And uh, as I sat down, this attorney looked at me and said, Professor Bazerman, the Department of Justice re requests that you amend your testimony to note that it would not be relevant if any of the following four legal conditions existed. And then he read me a bunch of legally, legal gobbledygook that I didn't come close to understanding. And he asked me whether I would amend my testimony accordingly. And I looked at him and I said, now, you know me well enough to know I didn't understand what you just said. Why would I amend my testimony? And he said, because if you don't, there's a good chance that my bosses are going to eliminate you from the trial and you won't appear in court on Wednesday. And I said, well, in that case, I don't amend my testimony. And he said, OK, then let's continue to prepare in case you're still in the case. And when this happened, I was kind of stunned, but I, I didn't really understand what was happening. Um, uh, I, I knew that, that the trial attorneys were under pressure from higher levels in the Department of Justice. I didn't really know what to do. Like, so who would you call about this weird episode? Okay. What happened, I'm not really sure, okay? But what I did was I forgot about it. I appeared in court on that Wednesday. I continued on with my life. And then six weeks later, I was in London, and I woke up um, at 5 a.m. in the morning um, in my London hotel, and I went to the New York Times webpage to catch up on the news because I couldn't sleep. And a guy named Matt Myers, who's the president of Tobacco Free Kids, who's a really quite wonderful anti-tobacco guy, had come forward with testimony that Robert McCollum, the number two official in the Department of Justice, had attempted to corrupt his testimony using the exact same technique that I had experienced back on April 30th. Okay? And at that point, it was like everything was abundantly clear. Okay? Sort of high levels of the Department of Justice had attempted to corrupt my testimony, um, and I was supposed to come forward, and I did all that kind of stuff. But what strikes me is that I went six weeks sort of basically engaging in bad behavior of not noticing and not even kind of figuring out that I should do something. Okay? If I had called friends, if I had called people like Larry Lessig, he could have told me that some, something was wrong. But life was busy and I just didn't do anything. And I think that that's kind of the story that a lot of us experience, is that if we stopped and thought about it, we would do something. But life is often busy, and we often just ignore the information around us. And I think that that's a significant issue, because if people had a greater propensity to act on, mis uh, on, mi on inappropriate behavior around them, then those who are engaging in bad behavior would be less, far, far less likely to do so. OK. Um, we also tend to not notice unethical behavior when people do their dirty work through others. Now, as motivation for this, I'm going to show you a picture that you probably have seen many times before. How, how many of you have never seen this picture? Wow, OK, it's more than I thought. All right, so this is a very famous philosophy problem. The train's coming down the track. If you do nothing, it's going to kill those five people. But you are the person in blue, and you can turn a switch. And if you turn the switch, the train will switch to the other track. And you'll save those five people, but you'll kill the one person on the upper track. Now, this is trolley land, so there are no legal implications. Um, and the question is, do you switch or not? Okay? And 
Um, I'll tell you in advance so that, uh, to save time, my estimate is about 75% of you would say, yes, I switch. Okay. Uh, and here's a sister problem. It's called the footbridge problem. And on the footbridge problem, this is your little person. That's you in blue. Train's coming down the track. And this time, what you have the option of doing is pushing over the person in brown, and they will fall onto the track, and they will become what we technically call a trolley stopper. <laughs> okay? And you'll save the five people, but one person will die again. Okay? And um, uh, by the way, this is trolley land, so all this happens without any uncertainty. That's definitely what happens. Um, it's a quick, painless death. And do you push them or not? And most of you would say no. Okay? And some of you are mildly disturbed by the fact that you said yes on the top and no on the bottom. And others of you are thinking these are entirely different problems. Why are you, why are you implying any inconsistency whatsoever? So we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, I will tell you that uh, Professor Joshua Green in the psychology department, um, who's an amazing researcher, he's kind of the king of trolley land. Um, and um, among the amazing things that he's learned about this problem is that these two problems aren't even solved in the same part of the brain. Okay? So different brain regions respond to all these. Anyhow, um, uh, I, I, I had been a fan of trolley land. Um, I hadn't done any research in trolley land when, when uh, Professor Green joined our faculty as a young assistant professor um, in 2005. And in 2006, I finally got around to having lunch with Josh. With, with Josh and um, and um, the day before we had lunch, this article was in the newspaper. And um, it's about a, 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 a nice pharmaceutical firm called Merck. Uh, they brought you Vi Vioxx and, and other products. Um, but they also had a couple of drugs called Mustergen and Cosmogen. And the basic problem <clears throat> with Mustergen and Cosmogen is not enough people were buying it. Okay, now these are cancer products. And you kind of have a bit of a problem with, um, with slow-moving cancer products um, because you, what you could do, since people tend to be loyal to their preferred cancer product, is you could dramatically increase the price. But the downside of that is somehow the media gets annoyed with you for doing that. Okay? So you get extra revenue. You lose very few extra customers, but you get a PR hit. So what do you do? Well, the good news is that there's a company by the name of Ovation in Deerfield, Illinois, and they will solve this problem for you. Okay? They are in the business of buying slow-moving technologies like this, and you can anticipate roughly the day after they buy it, the price will go up by 1,000%. Okay? And when the customer gets mad at Ovation, that's less of a problem because Ovation doesn't have a brand name that they're worried about protecting. Now, this may sound like an interesting story. Well, th this is kind of the, what the, the business that Ovation is in. Now, skipping Ovation as a business model, I want you to think about Merck and the decision of selling the drugs, drug to, um, to Ovation. Now, certainly you might imagine that you have the right to sell off any product you want out of your inventory. Um, after all, it could be a nuisance in your production process. Oh, but I forgot to tell you something. Ovation, at least at this point in time, doesn't actually make drugs. So if you sell them the intellectual property, they will also require that you sign a manufacturing agreement to produce the drug for them for an extended number of years. OK. So this is the story. Merck did sell the drug to Ovation. The price did go up by, a, um, by a, an, a, an amount that I'm describing. Um, and Merck did continue to manufacture the drug. So this is motivation for Nirupa Hari and Karim Kassam and Josh Green and myself to, to write the following problems. And basically, um, you can read a, mar a pharmaceutical has a cancer drug with a slow moving market, et cetera, et cetera. They're so, it's costing $2.50 to make the pill, and they're selling it for $3. And we ask people, how unethical would it be? And we asked two different groups, kind of like Professor English did to either raise the price from $3 to $9 or to sell it to somebody else who increases it to $15. Okay. And as I'm implying, people aren't very good at seeing the dirty work when you do your dirty work through others. Um, 
So people hold you more accountable for 3 to 9 by yourself than 3 to 15 indirectly. Um, and we're going to come back and take a look at the question, can we do anything about that? Because I think the answer is that we can. Okay. And what we can do is, instead of asking two different groups, if we ask people which of these is more unethical, now people compare the two, they see through the transparency involved, and now they see the indirect increase from 3 to 15 is more unethical than the direct increase from 3 to 9. So what I want you to notice here is that when people compare two or more strategies, they tend to be more reflective and see through um, the kind of what we view as a mistake of not seeing through the indirect effects of your actions. Okay. So now I want to try to do the same thing again, and I'm going to use this same separate versus joint preference reversal to try to see what we can do about gender discrimination. Okay? So what I just showed you a minute ago is that people ignore bad behavior if done through the, through the actions of others, um, but when we make it transparent, it becomes clear. So we're going to try to do that in the, <coughs> um, in the discrimination domain. Um, and um, what goes on here is that um, we've already had a bunch of people in an experimental lab um, do either math puzzles or verbal puzzles, and they've done them in two stages. They've done one chunk stage one, another, stunk, uh, another chunk stage two, and they were rewarded based on how well they performed. And um, for simplicity, if you imagine that the mean performance is 10 puzzles solved, um, that'll give you a good metric um, to, um, to, to see what's going on. Now, I want you to imagine that you're, you are employers, and we make you familiar with the math or verbal puzzle. Um, the verbal puzzle looks like this. You're trying to look for words. And the math puzzle has to do with adding up five two-digit numbers. Um, and you're told to, uh, some basic demographics about what's going on here. And what your job is, is to pick an employee to solve puzzles for you at stage two. So you're effectively hiring a puzzle solver for you at stage, uh, for stage two. And we're going to pay you based on how many puzzles they solved. Okay. And we are going to either give you a choice of one specific person or a randomly selected person out of the population who solved these puzzles. And the person that we tell you who is a concrete person is either a male or a female, and they either scored nine or 10 puzzles during round one of their performance. And you're going to get paid based on their performance in round two. And we give you other information about their nationality, their place of residence, or student status, none of which predicts performance at all. So that's basically filler information. So basically, you can have a random person, or you can have a, for example, male who solved nine puzzles in stage one. So that's what the separate condition looks like. The joint condition allows you three options. You can have a random person, or you can have a female who solved nine, or you can have a male who solved 10, or you might get a female who solved 10 and a male who solved nine. Okay? And you get to pick. And basically what happens here is that above the diagonal is separate. So I'll try to make sense out of that. The way to read this is 66% of people who were offered a male who solved 10 math puzzles in stage one prefer that male to solve their puzzles in stage two over a randomly selected alternative. Okay? Turns out that people are happy with a male regardless of whether they were a high or a low performer. Low performing males still get higher, 65%. Okay. And you'll see that 66 and 65 are higher than 44 and 53, which are the percent of females who are selected over a randomly selected other. Okay. A lot of people want to know why is 53 higher than 44, and the answer is because this is real data. I didn't make it up, and data rarely comes in perfect. Okay? But the 66-65 is significantly greater than the 
53. Okay? But I want you to take a look at what happens when we offer people um, a high-performing female versus a low-performing male. So the 57 and the 3 come from the same population. Basically, those are people who are offered the female who solved 10 puzzles, the male who solved 9 puzzles, or a randomly selected other. And what I want you to see is that discrimination based on gender has entirely disappeared. People are making the decision based on performance, not based on gender. Okay? So the basic idea here is when you compare two or more people, you're far less likely to, disc to discriminate than if you had evaluated those individuals one person at a time. And then we precisely replicate that because just as people are use stereotypes to pick males to solve their math puzzles, people prefer females to solve their verbal puzzles. So 85 and 50 are greater than 64 and 35, but when we offer people the high-performing male or the low-performing female, 52% 50 per, take the high-performing male, 16 take the low-performing female, and the remainder take the random choice. So what we see is a kind of a dramatic effect of people who are much more performance-based when they are making decisions two at a time. And we're certainly looking for a firm or a state government, by the way, um, who will let us muck with their employment system okay, and change their employment system so that employment decisions are made comparatively rather than sequentially. Um, and we think that that can have a significant effect on performance. All right. Now back to trolley land. Um, so some of you are obsessed with the fact that you tended to switch but not push. Um, others of you don't care. Um, but to be honest, um, if I was a switcher and not a pusher, it would bug me. And I want to figure out how to get people to think more about the outcomes that they're creating. So what I want you to do is now imagine the top problem. Instead of having five people on the bottom track, there's only three people there. I, I would change it, but I haven't redrawn the diagram. So you got three people, and the question is, do you switch or not? On the bottom, you still got five. Okay? And I'll quickly tell you that what we're going to do here is that we're going to look at how many will save the three by switching, killing one. How many will save the five by pushing. And the prediction that we're expecting is the three versus five is not that important. So more people will switch to save three than will push to save five. Okay? But then when we give people time to only do one or the other, that now all of a sudden people will see through the transparency of the issue. And pushing for five will become more attractive than switching for three. And that's basically what we get. So 76% are switching. Only 41 are pushing, okay, which is a high percent for pushing. Um, but when we give people the option of switching to save three, pushing to save five, or doing nothing, now all of a sudden pushing has become more attractive. Basically, people tend to become more, move more toward utilitarian thought under joint condition than under separate conditions. And we see that on a fairly regular basis. All right. So what I want to highlight with this repeated um, reviewing of joint versus separate is that there are things that we can do about the ethicality of people's decisions, how we present information, how we structure problems, how we create our institutional environments matters um, to a dramatic degree. And there are little things that we can do that can make big differences. Okay. One of the one of the sort of fascinating challenges in the whole decision bias literature, let alone the bounded ethicality literature, has to do with the fact uh, of can we debias human judgment? And my overall assessment is we can, but we're not, we can't do a great job of it. And if we can't debias human judgment, the question is are there other things that we can do that would change behavior? So some of you have read about the Behavioral Insights team in the, in, in the UK government. or uh, They're also called the Nudge Unit, named after the Thaler and Sunstein book Nudge. 
where rather than trying to debias human judgment of the, of the citizens in the country, what they try to do is create institutions that are less likely to result in biased behavior by the citizens, and in some cases, less likely to result in unethical behavior. And what I want to do is talk about a couple of institutions where we can see that we've built in bias. We've institutionalized corruption, and part of, the, of what we've institutionalized is bad psychology, basically, okay? or, or, or bias, bias in the human mind. And before I tell you about the first one, I want to reiterate, uh, Professor English mentioned that, um, that I'm a business school professor. Um, I want to plead guilty before I show you any more about the pharmaceutical industry um, to the fact that I've taught for many pharmaceutical firms. I actually like pharmaceutical firms. And I also have metal in my hip. And the way I got metal in my hip was um, when I was 28 years old, I, was, I, had, I, went, I went downhill skiing for the first time in my life. And then two weeks later, I was cross-country skiing. And I was going down a relatively small to medium-sized hill. Um, and I had been told that if you're going to hit the tree, sit down first. And I was going to hit the tree, so I sat down first, and I hit the point of my femur as I hit very hard snow. And so it didn't break, it more splattered, okay, which is like a really bad thing. So, uh, so that led to a toboggan ride through the woods to get me out of there, and then I was in a New Hampshire hospital, and we called somebody and he said, don't let him cut you there. Get down to Mass General. And so the next morning, I had an ambulance ride to Mass General. Then I went into surgery. I had never been in surgery in my life. Dr. Robert Boyd at Mass General proceeded to put in a plate for seven pins that go into the hip. And then at the top, there's something that looks, from, from my read of the x-ray, it looks like a deadbolt goes into the hip itself. So he put in all this metal into me to put me back together again. And, um, and I spent nine days in Mass General. I used to spend a lot more, much more time in the hospital um, than you do now. And after nine days, I was scheduled to be released, and Dr. Robert Boyd came to visit me. And he said, um, and I think you should come back in a year or two. And I say, why? And he says, because I think you should let me take the metal out of your hip. And I said, now why would I want you to do that? And he said, because you're a young man. And when you're young is a good time to have operations on your hip. And I said, why is, that, why is it good? He said, because when you're older, this surgery is like really difficult. I said, how old is old? He said, 40. So that gave me uh, some years to think about this. So, um, soon after, I, uh, when this happened, I was a professor at MIT. And soon after, I, I left for Northwestern. And very quickly, I was teaching executives. And one of the interesting things about executive programs at the Kellogg School at Northwestern was they, the, the executive programs were filled with doctors. Like, there were doctors in large numbers. So like 10 12% of the class typically were doctors. And I was teaching them how to negotiate more effectively. And over lunch break, they wanted to talk about negotiating their real world problems. And I wanted to talk about whether or not I should take the metal out of my hip. <laughs> okay. Now, so the following data is the only data that I don't know to be true. Okay. That is, I'm going to show you what I actually remember. But, but since memory is faulty, um, I'm not presenting to you this as data. But I am presenting it to you as my honest recollection of what I learned over the next few years as I asked dozens of doctors, surgeons and, sur surgeons and non-surgeons, the question, should I let Dr. Robert Boyd take the metal out of my hip? Okay. That's what I remember. Okay. As far as I recall, I never met a surgeon who thought I should leave the metal in the hip. And I never met a non-surgeon who thought you should let a surgeon touch you unless something's bothering you. Okay. Now, what I want to highlight is that the surgeons, oh, I, I lost some labels there, but you can figure out what it's. What, what, so, um, um, so basically, all the surgeons are saying operate, and all the non-surgeons are saying don't operate. Sorry about the, the, the labels there. Um, so now, many of these surgeons, by the way, are, they, they're not even 
They're not even hip surgeons. They're not going to get the business. Okay. But they seem to think that the cost-benefit analysis is, is substantially different than the doctors. And the question is, what's going on? And we now know. So the, this, this, this activity occurs before lots of the contemporary literature. But we know that physicians who practice a certain procedure see that procedure as much more necessary. We know that doctors who are doing consulting work for a particular pharmaceutical are dramatically more likely to prescribe that drug. And we also know that as they're doing this, they believe that they're providing the very best medical care possible to their patient, okay? which seems logically inconsistent. And if conflict of interest occurred only through intentional corruption, it would be consistent. But to the extent that taking the money or earning the money leads you to be biased in what you see as the optimal treatment, this becomes quite consistent. So I want to introduce one more topic, auditing. Now, for most of you, um, the idea of auditing is shockingly boring. And I want to tell you that if we go back before Enron, the topic was even more boring than it is today. OK. Um, and because it's so boring, probably most of you haven't ever thought much about it. But I'm going to tell you about auditing. And I'm going to do my best to make it interesting. So in the US and in most developed economies, if you're incorporated, your books have to be audited by a quote unquote independent auditing firm. And the reason that our country requires that is so that other parties can look at the books of the firm and decide and basically put some faith in the numbers that are in the annual audited books of the firm. Okay. So <clears throat> the goal of auditing is to provide an independent assessment of the financial conditions of the firm. The goal of medicine is to provide the best medical advice and treatment possible. Okay. And what I want to argue is that we've allowed both of these institutions to develop in a way that are psychologically inconceivable to offer that. Okay. What we don't want to focus auditing on is to maximize the profitability of four firms in society, which is what I think we're doing, and in medicine to maximize the earnings of doctors. Those look like corrupt institutional, institutionally corrupt goals. Okay. So, what are the problems? Well, in auditing, auditors have a vested self-interest in keeping the company being audited happy. Okay. Why is that? Well, we've, uh, we require independent auditing. Again, that's quote unquote independent auditing. But we let the firm pick their auditor. So if you're auditing my firm and you tell me my books aren't good, what happens to your client? you're likely to lose them. I'm likely to take my business to a, another auditing firm. But we not only allow firms to pick their auditor or to shop for the lowest quality provider possible, but we also allow auditing firms to sell consulting firms. So since you folks aren't accounting majors, thank goodness, okay, if you do take a job with KPMG, it's most likely to be in the consulting division of KPMG. So we have a situation where the auditor not only audits and wants to get rehired, but they also want to sell consulting services. Now, if we move you from what you currently are majoring in to another university so that you can major in accounting, and you take a job with KPMG, and I tell you three years from now, you're going to leave KPMG and take another job. What's your best guess of how you're going to find your new employer? The empirical answer is the best guess is that you're going to go to work for one of the firms you've been auditing. So what is your reward for telling me my books aren't very good? You basically have eliminated a job prospect. So what I'm arguing is that we require independent auditing and we then destroy every basis for expecting people 
to act impartially because people have a self-interest in not noticing that the books of the firm are, are cooked. Similarly, in medicine, when we allow doctors to have incentives that have to do with getting consulting contracts from pharmaceutical firms while making decisions on whether to, to prescribe that drug, we're corrupting the process of making the best medical decision possible. All right, so I think I've said all this. Um, yeah, I do. Okay. All right. Um, now, a little bit on um, sort of some legislation. Um, um, many of you have read about the fact that Enron collapsed um, in 2001. And then came along some, th something called Sarbanes-Oxley. And Sarbanes-Oxley is a very complex piece of legislation that I can tell you businesses hate. Okay? And businesses hate it because it creates lots of extra regulatory control over their firm. Um, and it's very complex and it costs a lot of money to comply with Sarbanes-Oxley. Now, as background, I should tell you Sarbanes thought that firms needed to be regulated more after the collapse of Enron. Oxley did not. Oxley was a fiercely anti-regulation -regula guy. And Sarbanes-Oxley is a compromise bill. And one of the strategies that was recommended was that auditors should be forced to rotate after X number of years. And the basic idea here is if you, if you can't keep on hiring me, then I have less incentive to be biased in auditing your books because I won't get the reward of getting rehired. <clears throat> and I'm not making this up, this is too bizarre to believe, but Republican mem members of Congress in the last 24 hours before the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley effectively changed the, law, the, the provision of Sarbanes-Oxley from you have to change your auditing firm to you have to change the lead auditor on the account. So if you imagine there's a team of 12 auditors working on a particular account, number one has to quit that account and number two can take over but you can keep the same auditing firm. And then they call that auditor rotation. Okay. Um, there was a limit on non-audit services. So there was a scaling back on the degree to which auditing firms could provide consulting services. Um, but not all non-audit services were eliminated, just some. And if you happen to be worried about the big four auditing firms, they were able to get a new kind of business as a result. So they were losing some consulting services, but they got a new kind of business. Anybody have a guess as to what that new business was? <clears throat> Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. Okay. The, Sarbanes-Oxley is complex enough that firms needed guidance and the people they most commonly turn to for guidance are the people who are doing their auditing work. Okay? And leaders can't move between, for, be, be, leaders of the auditing firms can't go work for their clients, but most of the people actually doing the work can. Now, I want to stop and highlight in this story the issue of intentional corruption versus, that should be unintentional corruption, Intentional corruption versus unintentional and unconscious corruption. What I want to highlight is I don't mean to accuse the auditor who's biased of anything intentionally corrupt. And I'm not under the illusion that I could be an auditor and not be biased. Okay. It's a human condition to see the data in the direction that we prefer to see it. But it is corrupt, I would believe, not illegal, just corrupt, for the final four auditing firms to basically spend millions and millions of dollars lobbying to buy the laws that keep us from creating an independent auditing system. And that's basically what we do. So I like to ask this question because I think it's an easy question. In order to maintain Auditor independence, auditors are prohibited from establishing durable long-term cooperative relationships from their clients, from providing non-audit services to their clients, and from taking jobs with their clients. Or you could start by creating a variety of incentives that lead auditors to want to please their clients, and then try to identify a complex set of legislative and professional incentives to counteract the corrupting influences created by the desire to please the client, which makes more sense. Okay. And for all of you who are going with number two, 
that would make you consistent with the U.S. Congress, okay? Because that's what we do. Okay. Um, what makes more sense in order to provide the best possible med medical care? Doctors are prohibited from establishing relationships that create incentives that depart from the from providing the best possible care, or start by creating a variety of incentives that lead doctors to provide specific recommendations and treatments that might not be optimal for the patient, and then try to identify a complex set of legislative and professional incentives to counteract the corrupting influences. Again, we basically opt for number two on a quite regular basis. Okay, um, and what are these um, kinds of corrupting influences? Um, uh, whether doctors are rewarded for fee-for-service or for referrals, that has a, a significant effect. From uh, getting research from a pharmaceutical firm, from getting gifts, from get, being paid for speaking, from being paid for teaching materials for the pharmaceutical firms, often at unacceptably high rates, or to operate or not, as I talked about earlier. Um, Dr. David Korn, um, who used to be the associate provost at Harvard and before that the dean of the Stanford Medical School said, the relationship between the public and, and academic medicine is special, different from any other in academia, and rooted and trusted is nowhere more evident or fragile than in medical research. And he's somebody who's deeply concerned that the medical decisions that will affect you over the next, I guess, 60 years um, will not be as objective as you would like because of many of the corrupting influences that we allow to exist. Um, Upton Sinclair said it is difficult to get a man, sorry about man, um, you know, feel free to substitute person, to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding that. So what we see here is that we institutionalize a variety of systems that take advantage of the corruption of the human mind. And in auditing, for many, many decades, auditors argued that the protect protection against corruption was the integrity of the auditor. And they argued that without integrity, they would have no basis for being in business. Well, I think it's pretty clear over the last 13 years, their, their integrity has been entirely shot, and yet they continue to be very profitable organizations. Okay? Integrity was never part of their job. Their job was to get people to pay them to provide non-independent audits or auditing services under a false um, label. Okay, um, just a little bit on sort of people having sort of unnecessary deaths or being too ill, Enron, where do they come from? They come from conflicts of interest in medicine and auditing. Where do these failed systems come from? They come from our failure to create me meaningful campaign finance reform. We allow money to buy politics. That creates the institutions. The institutions, in turn, lead to these faulty decisions. Okay. And finally, I want to highlight that this is kind of a bipartisan issue. Um, so one of my favorite examples of dysfunctional laws was that in 2000, and, uh, for, for those of you who my earlier comment was too left-leaning, I apologize, so we'll try to, this one will be more even. Um, so in 2003, a Republican-backed law was passed that prohibited Medicare from negotiating drug prices um, with, from, from drug companies. So basically, Medicare was paying full list price of whatever they bought, and Republicans were effective lobbying, based on lobbying efforts in pharmaceuticals to keep uh, Medicare from having the opportunity to negotiate over drug prices. Okay. Democratic lawmakers, in turn, tried to pass legislation, the Medicare Prescription, uh, Prescription Drug Price Negotiation Act of 2007, allowing Medicare to negotiate prices directly with pharmaceutical manufacturers. So this kind of seems like it's putting me on the Democratic side again. Except the really disturbing part was that the Democratic proposal did not allow the government to not reach an agreement restricting patient access to the drug of their choice. So essentially what Medicare was told is go negotiate, but by the way, if the pharmaceutical doesn't give in to your attempts to negotiate, you have to pay them whatever they demand. Okay, now I teach negotiations, and this is not good practice. <laughs> okay, and pharmaceuticals are smart enough to figure out the implications, um, and so basically, 
this negotiation act did nothing to enhance negotiations. Um, and as recently as last week, the New York Times covered a proposal to fix that, and resistance continues, undoubtedly because of the corruption that exists that's been institutionalized into the system. Okay, so um, what I've tried to talk about is sort of a, a, an expansion on what Professor Benaji talked about in terms of the psychology of bounded awareness. I've tried to provide hints that if we think hard about this, we could, we could create interventions that um, could potentially make behavior more ethical. Um, and I've also suggested that too often we sit by and look at institutions that we're, we're all smart enough to look at and say, these are bound to lead to bad behaviors, but we allow these corrupted institutions to sit um, and to continue without appropriate intervention. So with that, it um, looks like there's like 10 minutes left. I'm happy to talk about anything you want to talk about, uh, other than how do you get into HBS or something. I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Floor is open. Yes, please. How do you get an HBS? <laughs> I don't know. I, I am sure I, could, I am sure I would have been rejected. I, I did get rejected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please. Uh, in the, I guess it was yeah, you go for it. Okay. You, and then to the person. Problem. In the second scenario. Yeah. What portion of people raise the possibility of them jumping off the bridge and being afraid? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so uh, I'm not taking any credit for that. This, but. People like Josh Green have done a phenomenal job of writing those problems and clarifying that that's not possible, clarifying that there is no, um, that, that there are no legal, legal implications of, of engaging in these behaviors to basically eliminate those options and to make the problems contrast what, what, what you want to contrast. But it's very nice if you wanted to jump off the, uh, jump off the bridge yourself. Yes? I'm just curious whether or not you can throw a metal out of your head. Oh, the metal, no, it's still there. Yeah, I, I believe those doctors who say don't don't let surgeons cut you if it's not bothering you. So so I'm 58. Um, so far so good. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Is it possible in some circumstances that, for example, like things that we interpret as bias is simply because we have more they have more information? Sure. I mean, I think that I, I I yeah I think that there are lots of times when we can make false inference um, about people who know something that we don't know. Okay. I think we, and, and that's why psychologists so commonly run experiments in the lab where we're able to run controlled clinical trials effectively to identify effects. But I, but I find myself, you know, so I read the New York Times every morning. It's kind of the local newspaper in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And, um, um, and, um, and I see things and I'm, I'm, I'm noticing stories of bias all the time which is different than to say I have conclusive evidence of that. So for me, I try to calibrate controlled laboratory experiments with a careful reading of the details of what's going on in real world problems. But I don't make the inference that, that I can infer bias based on something that's happening in the field when I can see into the mind of the person who's the actor. Now, there's, um, how many of you are economists? Yeah, so, so, so in a, uh, and they admit it. Um, so, um, but one of the things that's happening in, in economics is that um, the kind of the new gold standard for empirical evidence is field experiments, where you get an institution to actually run a clinical trial where you randomly assign people to one of two different conditions. Okay? Um, and those are situations where we could potentially see bias of real actors in the actual environment. Okay. So, um, so one of the, <clears throat> one of the results that, that my colleagues and I have in the lab is that it, we create an environment where we, we pay you for puzzles that you solve. Okay. But then we allow you to tell us how many puzzles you solved. And we pay you based on how many you report you solved. And I know this will shock you, but some people lie to get paid more. <laughs> All right. So, um, so, um, and, and it, the short version is people don't lie by a lot. They, buy, they lie by a little. So they include that last puzzle that they almost solved, okay? 
So, so there's some cheating that occurs, and so we, we, we pay a, a bit extra for that cheating. Um, but then we want to figure out how do we reduce the cheating. And um, uh, some of you have probably fi filled out your tax forms, and you work through your 1040 form, and then you sign in at the bottom. So we create a form where people have to report to us how many puzzles they solved, and then they sign it. And I already told you some people cheat. So we move the signature from the bottom to the top. And before you fill out the form, you have to sign your name. What I'm about to fill in is true. Okay? We drop cheating, cheating by about 50%. Okay? And so we currently have the, the UK government testing this on actual tax forms. Okay? So getting the result in the lab is useful for convincing real actors to actually try this in a real world context. And similarly with the gender results that I showed you, um, we would much rather have the results in the field than in the lab. Um, but having the results in the lab, we hope, will help us find a company that wants to actually run the clinical trial of what it would look like in the field. Yes, sir? So why do you support the process? Why do I? Uh, oh. Um, I hope not. Um, so so I, I also testify against pharmaceutical firms. So, um, so I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. So I, I, I not only work for pharmaceutical firms, I do it often, I, I do it without feeling guilty about it. Okay? There are many pharmaceutical firms that I wouldn't work for. But overall, I think it's an industry that does far more good than bad. Okay? So if I can help them do things that makes the process more effective, I would want to do that. So, uh, yeah, doctors say about your hip. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, As surgeons would say about replacing your hip. Yeah, so, so let, me, let me try to sort this out, because I'm not sure I, I, I don't have any ethical problem with working for a pharmaceutical firm. But I'm not under the illusion well, that if I was then going to advise you on whether uh, I worked for Johnson & Johnson more than any other pharmaceutical firm. So if I tell you that their Band-Aids are better than everybody else's, I think you should be really suspicious of that. Okay, so, uh, so, I, th so I, I, I completely believe that I have a tilted lens on how I see Johnson & Johnson. But, but that's different than, uh, um, than sort of thinking that industry is bad. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I kind of believe in markets and incentives and all those kinds of good things. Sure, but they then shouldn't be in the business of deciding whether to use a, that company's product or not. They should get rid of that, dis, that part of the decision to somebody else. So, uh, so I don't mind a doctor working for a pharmaceutical firm. I mind a doctor working for a pharmaceutical firm and then being in a position of deciding whether I'll take that drug or a competitive drug. Okay? That, that's where I think the conflict of interest comes in. Am I answering your question? Um, I, I haven't. I've only worked for the government against other pharmaceutical firms. Right, yeah, and, and I don't, and I, but, and would I? Um, I, um, I don't, it, would, it, it would have to, be, I could imagine that I might say yes, but it would have to, it would depend on the case. So I tend to not work for companies in court, okay? So I don't actually like working. I don't like being an expert witness. I, I do that when I see a wrong in society and I'm on the side that I think is, is on the good side of things. If, there was a, if a pharmaceutical firm I liked was in a lawsuit where I thought that they were being unfairly attacked by another firm, would I work for them? I think I would, okay? And I'd probably, I, I certainly would want to disclose everything, uh, all the biases that I, that I would have on the front end. Yeah, I mean, the, the other thing that I do to solve, the, I'm trying to answer your question, and it's a little bit tricky. I, I think that there's enough of a problem with conflict of interest by expert witnesses in the courtroom context um, that when I do do expert witness work, 
which is, not the, which is a minor portion of, of outside consulting work that I do. But when I do do it, I, I don't keep the money. I, I donate the money because I don't want my testimony to be biased by my financial incentives, if that makes sense. No. Do you, do you think it might be advantageous for Johnson & Johnson to have you testify against, say, Procter & Gamble and then just get rid of the government uh, incentivization? Do you think they might have some sort of incentive to get uh, expert people who would be good expert witnesses? Yeah. So, so uh, your question's too complex for me to process without, I, I, I think I would need specifics to answer your question. So, so, so I, I, I guess the position I'm, uh, I, I want to sort of I, I want to clarify. I don't want to be in a position where I think that my advice is biased due to financial incentives to myself, okay, or financial incentives to an organization I care about, Harvard or whatever else, okay. Um, but but that doesn't mean I don't want to ever work for a corporation. I, I, I'm perfectly comfortable working for corporations. Yeah. Yes. Potentially, yeah. Because, I mean, you don't know how to do Yeah, so, I, mean, so I, was, I was once being deposed, um, and, uh, and I, you, uh, these things are public, so I guess you could find it. So I, I don't mean to claim I'm getting the quote exactly right, but I was asked, but Professor Bazerman, aren't you biased in your testimony based on the fact that you're paying you X dollars per hour? And I said, I, I was concerned about that. Um, uh, and that's why I've, I made the decision on the front end that I'm donating 100% of my earnings from this case to charity. Okay. So the next question was, well, Professor Bazerman, doesn't that make you a vigilante who's just against our industry? Okay, so, and, and, and at some point, the answer is possibly. You know? So it, it may be that, that whatever views I have about the particular issue could affect my testimony. Um, and we want to solve as much as we can to reduce corruption, but that doesn't mean that we're going to ever get that completely perfect. No. Okay, looks like we have 30 seconds left. Any last minute word, word of wisdom? Well, thank you all for sitting here for so long. Thank you.